So we're here with uh, Joseph Rael, who's uh, also known as Beautiful Painted Arrow. And uh, Joseph, you're um, uh, the recipient of the Eagle Feather Award that was awarded to you by the Society for Shamanic Practice. Okay. And um, among many things that you've done in your life, you've been a healer and a writer and um, a teacher. So we we're, we're, feel very privileged to be here, um, to be able to interview you and ask you a, a few things and hope that you'll just say a few things about your life and about um, what you'd like people to know. Okay, sounds good. Well, I'm very pleased that you're here. I've been traveling, traveling internationally after the vision I had uh, in 1983. And the consequence of that uh, it was about building peace chambers. And if you look to the left, you'll see these, these uh, uh, um, put it over there for the camera, uh, sound chambers in different places, like in Australia, uh, some are in, in Austria, Norway, uh, and, and uh, some of the other European countries, England, and so on and so forth. So I grew up in, on, in here in Ignacio, Southern Indian Reservation, in 1935. Um, and I, uh, my mother died when I was a, a youngster. I wasn't very old, and so uh, my father uh, put us in foster homes at Pickery's Pueblo, mm -hmm. which is north of Santa Fe. And so I grew up at Pickery's Pueblo. Uh, and some of my books that I've, I've written, I talk about the this, this spiritual journey from, from Ignacio, Colorado. And we drove in a truck. Uh, my father took us boys down to, um, to Pickery's and the journey and the spirits that I encountered on the, on the, way, on the way there. And in, in one of the books, I talk about that. But for me, and I think for all of us, um, life happens to us. We don't do anything in life. Life just happens because life happens to us in such a way that we're even scheduled as to when we're going to be born, I think. Now that I'm 80, over 80 years old, I think that that's a fact. And that all the experiences that we have were already uh, programmed for us. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we became writers, we became actors, actresses, we became farmers and ranchers, and we became other people uh, on planet Earth. So for us as Native Americans, for us others, like uh, the two leggeds, uh, the two leggeds, and the four leggeds, and the wingeds, and the beings of water. All of us, I think of them as cultures, different cultures. They're, we're working here then, many of us are coming from different cultures to live life on the earth, what we call Mother Earth. And so I, I come, I'm half uh, Picaris. Pueblo Indian, and I'll have, in this lifetime, I'll have a Southern Ute Indian tribal member. So, my mother was from Southern Ute, and my father was from Pickery's Pueblo. I, I went to the Indian school in Santa Fe till I was uh, in the 10th grade, and I left there and spent two years high school at Peñasco High School in North Central New Mexico, and I graduated there. And uh, I went down to uh, St. Joseph College in 1954. And I was there for one semester, and then I was called back to Pickery's, where uh, I, uh, I lived there at Pickery's uh, off and on, and then eventually I was called to Southern Ute, to come and live in Southern Ute. 
because there were some commitments that I had to do age-wise because I was here. And there were some commitments also that that are mine because of the fact that I lived at Pickery's. So I traveled back and forth between the tribes to do ceremonies. Mm -hmm. uh, because of, in early childhood, you're assigned certain uh, clan, clans, so you have to go there and do that. So I'd fly out of Australia when I was traveling, and um, or from Europe or from wherever, to attend the 10th of August at Pickery's, where they have the, the honor of St. Lawrence. Um, and the ceremonies there, and the dancing that that we were required to do as, as, as tribal members, as members of the tribe. So if you're a half tribal member or full blood, you still have to participate in the ceremonial um, process there. Mm -hmm. It's a requirement. So uh, from birth to death, you, you'll always belong to that tribe. In my case, I belong to Big Reese and I belong to Southern Dude. So at the moment of my death, if I'm at Picaris, then I get buried there. And if I'm at Southern Ute, then I'll be buried there mm -hmm. because I belong to both of them. Even though officially, according to the government records, I'm a member of the Southern Ute Indian tribe. Uh -huh. So my work began with the dances at Picaris and speaking the Tiwa language, which is a verb language. And, and, and then later in school, I learned a non-pronoun language. Um, and I attended the Santa Fe Indian School, along with other um, of the Pueblos from North Central New Mexico and then the Southern Pueblos, those Pueblos south of Santa Fe. And then much later, I, I worked at the Santa Fe Indian Hospital in Santa Fe. And primarily, my whole work has been with alcoholism and drug use. Mm -hmm. That's how I got started. Eventually, my name came up, and a, and a psychiatrist, and him and I just wrote this book. Well, then walk in the medicine well. Yeah, walk in the medicine well. So, uh, and you've read my first book, Being in Vibration. Yeah. So that was good. I remember hearing um, uh, when my mother was gardening at um, Ignacio, Colorado. South of Ignatian, actually, a place called La Boca. And um, I could hear the plants running around, berries, you know, mm -hmm. in the garden. And I also could hear uh, the trees and the willows and the other uh, talking, you know, their language. But uh, it was interesting that I could hear that language, and while it was different, it was just like sounds, and, but uh, it was inside of my mind, uh, the English version, or if I was in Pickery's, the Tiwa version, would, was what would come up. So I knew what was being said, even though it was a foreign language. I mean, you, you, you would turn up talking, for instance, um, talking that the carriages were too close to the road there, you know. Uh -huh. um, and later on, in, in, when I was in the seventh grade in Santa Fe, in 1947, I remember because uh, Mrs. Kimmerman was our homeroom teacher and she came up, she was really excited and she had a paper and it was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And she, she showed this picture and there was this saucer. This was, of course, an artist's rendition of it a man standing on, on this big saucer. And they said that somebody had seen or a crash landing of, of a flying saucer in Roswell, oh, yeah. Yeah, New Mexico. And I was in the seventh grade. I remember she was really excited. And I thought, wow, that means people from outer space. I was 12 years old. And anyway, in the seventh grade, so, um, I knew then that there was something that was happening because uh, my grandfather, by then he had died, uh, was my first teacher. 
and he talked about the beings that came here and lived at Picaris and taught at Picaris uh, the medicine ways. And then one day some of the Picaris left with them in a ship and traveled up, up into the night sky. And uh, when uh, in the 1950s, I think it was, or 60s, there were some excavations that were done, uh, uh, archaeological digs in Picaris, they found traces of that culture. Um, and, the, and what the artists did in the kibbutz, because a lot of them they had covered up in Picaris. When you're not using a kiva, you cover it up. Mm -hmm. And so they had drawn on the, on the walls these beams, not, not the way they looked, but uh, like the planes. Mm -hmm. And they re represented them like birds. And some were flying up, and then they would fly this way. And I knew as soon as I saw the birds that they weren't really birds. Yeah. They were uh, spaceships. And uh, in fact, there's some research, uh, I think, that a research was out of Texas University that was done in the 1950s. I think my, my father was governor then. But in, then it was, there was a lot of contention about, you know, that kind of work at that time because of uh, the tribes didn't want to share much of their right. uh, sacred, uh, sacred uh, uh, church and stuff. Anyway, um, I just kind of fell into this and uh, then I had visions uh, at the hospital uh, when I was working there. But I worked in, in the field of alcoholism because many of the veterans that came back in the Second mm -hmm. World War, I, I used to have to do part of the ceremonies for them. I see. With my grandfather, okay. I was kind of his gopher, okay. And you knew the languages. Yeah, and I knew the languages. So, um, so that's how I got involved. And then, and then later I found out that stuff started happening on my own. Um, my grandfather used to say, what did you dream last night? And I said, I had this dream. Well, to, to, because they would come in wagon, horse-drawn wagons, you know, in the 1950s from the different pueblos, you know, to see him. Mm -hmm. And he would put him, you know, give him a place to sleep. And then he would ask me to see what they drank. Or, and, and I said, this is what happened. And he would ask them and they'd say the same thing. So that's how he verified. That, that was such, that what I had recorded was the same as, as what they had dreamt. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's how I got started in that. It's kind of like you get sucked in, you know, and then there's no way to get out. People then say, well, he must have, he must be gifted or something. The guy's a little crazy, you know, and don't ask him to do anything because he'll do it. Uh, he never stops to ask why. <laughs> You know, one thing that really helps if you're showing this, don't ask why. Because why, the word why, means to miss the mark. Uh -huh. So in the English language, when I wrote being in vibration, I don't think I stressed it enough that it's the language, that sound vibration that we create with the voice that uh, we may in, in, inadvertently we're creating our own device. Mm -hmm. okay. Just by speaking. By speaking. Not realizing that when we say a word or three or four, um, because we, we live in two realities. One is, a, is the, the verb language, and the other is the non pronoun language. Uh, like German comes, and English, and, and, and Spanish, and, and uh, Italian. Uh, those languages come from, you know, the, the uh, first language that the Romans brought. Uh, yeah. Yeah. From Latin. Latin, yeah. Latin's, Latin language. And the verb language then is the other side. And I always think of the verb language, uh, say, being uh, this side. 
and this side is the non-prana and the physical body. So the left side, the, the verb language, yeah. and the right side, the noun language. That's right. And so you have to, what went wrong with me is I merged the two. Mm -hmm. And so I could read professor's minds, you know, and I didn't mean to. He'd be writing what the tests are going to be about, and I'm sitting there, and then over oh, there's the answer, you know. Of his head, I didn't, you know. Mm -hmm. So I worked really hard to try not to feel guilty or try not to feel ashamed, and that didn't work. So I said, What should I do? Well, I'll just ask the spirit world not to tell me anything, and I'll just become a good guesser. And I've got, I guess I've done well because I missed you. <laughs> you know, when I'm going to give an advice or, or treatment. I've always loved a human being. I don't know why. I just think they're just great. And uh, and even when they do wrong, you know, I just pray for them that they get forgiven mm -hmm. or even uh, blessed uh, because uh, they probably didn't mean it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that, as a, as a child growing up, that kind of thinking. So. That's how I fell into this whole um, of healing and stuff. And, and the other thing I tell people, I never did anything miraculous that I was responsible for. Because everything that I ever did happened because either it was supposed to happen or divine presence mm -hmm. came through. And my, my work was what it was. And so I've never taken credit for any anything that was was a miracle. And uh, and, and I, I even today, uh, well, we need to tell people today that I think is very important. You see, we're 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 moving higher and higher and higher into higher consciousness, but we, we travel in cycles. My cycle started out worth four years um, for the planet. It's four centuries. Every four centuries, <clears throat> the planet stops, not literally, I'm saying, but it stops growing. And at that point, it stops because then it's going to be in another four centuries. Mm -hmm. So something happened in the 10th century, for instance. We were had, uh, in Europe, we were having the wars with uh, uh, Queen Isabella and her coffers, you know, money the wars mm -hmm. against the, uh, um, what did they call them, from Africa, the African people. There was wars going on. And uh, so here comes uh, Columbus, right, 1492, he comes over and one of those ships is the Santa Maria. And one of the things that I get here is I, I see the, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary. She appeared to me when I was an explosion and here in Ignacio we were putting in a uh, gas system and someone lit a match and we were in an explosion. And I remember as as I was on my back and she's standing there and she says, you're going to be all right. And then she disappeared. I had two compound fractures here that I managed to walk on about 25 yards to and people, took, my relatives patients said, how did you do it? And I said, I don't know. I just got up and somebody else helped me and I walked up at compound fractures. And I wasn't able, I wasn't able to have them fixed by the you know, Indian Health Service because they said, you got to get old first because this operation is going to be repeated over a lot, a lot of times. And they only last for maybe 10, 15 years. That's what they told me, all the years. So I, I lived with pain in my knees. And uh, and I, I I just couldn't get used to a cane. Or maybe I was just plain stubborn. But, you know, so I lived with pain. And I think maybe that also added to my abilities, other abilities. Uh -huh. You know, the pain. Uh, yeah. And so... Uh, and I also learned that holiness uh, means, uh, I think in life as we grow 
older or you know, in age, physical age, that we become more complete. We become more and more complete. We, we start with nothing and then we complete. And that's why we become whole. And that's where the word holy comes from. Doesn't mean that we're saint, saintly or more saintly than. It just means that we're more complete. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have more spiritual uh, connections to deal with the current issue, whatever that issue may be. Mm -hmm. My grandfather left me with one saying, he said, because I said to him, I would like to do what you're doing. He went through the wall and came back and brought herbs, round them up and gave them to us and, and the drink, the ones of us that were their kids. He said, someday you'll have visions and these plants, the plant people will help you. So, but he said, when I asked him, can I do things like you're doing? He says, no, I said, you don't do what I've been doing. Uh, he said, uh, try to do, try to live the best that you can and, and do good things, help people, and wherever you can, pray for them and so on, pray for peace and so on. Because that's what he used to do and this is what you ought to do. He said, because that's going to get you to the top of, of a, a level. And then a new, a new idea will appear. And for me, it was the sound chambers. Uh -huh. Okay. Now that the sound chambers, there are this, these many, there, there's almost 70 or 80 of them in, okay. the, in the world. Um, that's done now. Could, could you just say a word about the sound chambers, what they do, or how one yes. uses them? Or? Yeah, the problem we have in the world is sound by the languages that we use. And the A ah means purity, the E eh means placement, the E means awareness, the O oh means childlike innocence, and the U oh means carry. So uh, when we chant, those A, A, E, O, U, it turns out that they're the same as the, the OM sound. Mm -hmm. All those sounds. Uh, but when you build a, f a physical something, like a chapel or a church or a sound chamber, where you have something going on, as soon as you concretize it, then you give it life. And the, this is Mother Earth that we're walking on, the Earth. The ground is Mother Earth. And right here is the ceiling, that's the sky, and that's the Father. And we have to constantly be bringing the sky and the Mother up and down, up and down. And we, when we're doing this, um, it's like the heart is going ka -thump. Ka thump, ka thump. Mm -hmm. You see, so what we do in between is important because that's the cause of the ka thump. And so we're evolving up here. Now, here is where we're at. And I want everyone to hear. We, if I don't say anything more today, I want to impress people enough, hopefully, that they will remember this. And that is that. We are now ready to do what we, we've been doing for centuries and centuries. We are living in this world here is an illusion. And the way I saw it in the vision, we come from the soul, the, the divine soul, into this moment. And for a moment, you're Jose, and I'm the other Jose, Joseph. And she's Elena. And then she goes quickly, she goes like that fast, like that fast. We go back to the source. Mm -hmm. We think we're here all the time, but we're not. That's what I saw in the vision. And then after that, I got the sound chambers. And I said, what? Okay. And I noticed that I was higher up, even though I'm here, down here. 
that I had come this high. So I think I had about eight blocks higher than my grandfather. And eight blocks are away there, a mile long, you know. You know, blocks. Yeah. Okay, so um, I was talking to Carolyn and I said, what? I wonder what this means, you know. And then it, then it came to me, we're ready to, we have, here's my physical body, and if I want to see you in Santa Fe, then I have to just lie back close to the earth, you know, the bed is closer to the earth than the ceiling. And then the energy of the two, father, the mother, uh, at three o'clock in the, in the, in the morning, um, should take me uh, and I can appear at your house, you know, and go in and say that we have an arrangement that we're going to meet at that time. And I can visit you, but I'm not, I'm, I'm in my non-ordinary body, right. but I'm visiting you at three o'clock. But my other body is still here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I don't need a car to go there. I don't need a train or a bus or a car or an airplane or or horseback because we're going to be able to do that. Therefore, we're not going to need rocketry to get to the moon. Mm -hmm. We can be here, we can lean back at three o'clock in the morning and like that. I don't know how many miles is up there, but I understand it's quite a ways. A lot of gasoline, you know, to be up there and back. That's expensive. Here, you just kind of lie back and, but don't try to fall asleep now, Chris. You try to, but you get it like in a meditative state. You know? Right. Okay, so, so if we, if maybe 10,000 people would do that at the same time everywhere on the planet, or even we could start with 11 or 12 people. And if we did that at 3 o'clock in the morning, nobody likes to stay up to 3 o'clock in any um, sanctuary or anything. They love to sleep. But if we could get that many people get, to get started with, eventually we're going to be able to appear and disappear mm -hmm. and not need the transportation that we need. Now that's how far we have evolved. And, and the signs are that uh, that we're for that I've seen that we're ready for that step to happen. So if I'm a Shia uh, uh, healer, it's because I kind of either fell into it or I was roped into it or I was pushed into it. And I said, where am I? And, and the answer is always, uh, I'm still trying to find out why by not, by not saying why, but rather saying, okay, I'll take another step and another step, and in doing so, apparently we open ourselves up to divine presence, and divine presence comes in, and uh, there's angels that are on the other side that come in to help me when I've been in dangerous mm -hmm. situations. Um, so I saw that happening in Europe. Um, people who, who are following the spiritual path, um, I think, live dangerously. But because they have these angels mm -hmm. that take care of people who are doing the spiritual work, um, and, and the people who are doing the spiritual work never have to contend with that energy because well, once in a while they do, but mostly they just go by and never sense anything because the people who are on the spiritual path don't have time you know, to worry about that. They just want to go and do a ceremony, go and do help people. Uh, donate to people if you have extra dollar here and there, and uh, and life just kind of because see we're going on this wheel and every time you you give you're you're getting higher and higher and we're over here now we're we're 
about ready to, you know, appear and disappear. Because we've already been doing the, we're here one moment, and then you're Steve in the physical body. Mm -hmm. But momentarily, that fast, you're back here again. So, heaven's sakes, we've been practicing that for centuries, right? So, uh, why don't we get it? We're just slow learners. Gosh, I got it one day and I stood up and John said, go back to bed. It's two o'clock in the morning and you woke me up. And I was having this really great dream. Dark. But your, your vision is very um, optimistic. Yes. So what you're saying is that the, the world has evolved and as we're ready now for mm -hmm. the next step, mm -hmm. and we just need to take that step. That's right. But we're ready. Yeah, we're ready. So that's very encouraging. Yes. So, so many people think, well, this is the end. There's no hope. We're going to destroy the planet. And, you know, mm -hmm. But your vision is much more positive than that. Yeah, because I feel positive about it. You know why? Because I went to Florida here two weeks ago. And I helped my friend get back into his body, and I didn't have to leave the house. I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any uh, any uh, complaint about airplanes, you know, traveling. I'd love to travel, you know, get up there, look down, <laughs> and see the ground, and see which mud puddle I'm going to fall into. But. Actually, I saw a plane crash one time. I was getting ready. I was living in Bernalillo, and I was getting ready to go to um, a meeting. I think it was in Tennessee. A large group was going to meet there. You know how they get uh, speakers reading three or four books. You got to show up, see them. You know, <laughs> you know, and special. And then all these people gather. These people, and they make a lot of money. You know, and give you five hundred dollars for showing up. And house to stay and every once in a while you see a snake go by, you know, and it's out in the swamp somewhere. So, but you just say, God is taking care of me. And the reason why I say that because, you know, I've, I've gone to, done ceremony with the snake people and, you know, put the snake in their mouth and dance with them, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know them. Yeah. You know, we won't talk about religion here. Much. So, um, life is life. I taught, I said, I met a uh, person, her, her name was Estrella Newman in Mexico City, and we went to have a meeting with the, uh, the Indians down there. My father used to go back and forth. To, he said we had relatives in Mexico. Um, and she's the one that said, La vida no es un sueño, you know, life is but a dream. And then they put us in the boat, you know, row, 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 gently down, you know, to the journey. So, so every once in a while I'm flying through Spanish and I don't mean to, but it's just life, I guess. So <laughs> she was the one that, that said, that uh, every every human being is a star, mm. and because they're a star, they uh, they illuminate their own path because they they have a destiny. Those stars have a destiny, and so we have a destiny. And there's really no death, she said, in in a poem. She would say, "There's really no death. You're just." And this will, you, you, you expire, and then uh, 22 day, you, days later, you, you're uh, coming back in again, and, and if you're lucky, you get off this wheel and get on the next wheel. And if you have to stay on this wheel, hopefully you have not did enough bad things that you have to stay on this wheel along with all your other relatives. I spent most of the time gossiping about you because you were helping these people and and they're they're not good people, you know, but 
you help them, so there you are, stuck with them again. Only now you're at a higher level. Because eventually I think we disappear. All of us. All of us who have been on this journey for billions and billions and billions of light years. It finally comes to, to, to one point of light. And then it goes out. And I don't know if it's going to be the Big Bang again, but it'll go out. And uh, because otherwise we'd be bored. It's going to be a whole new journey again. Mm -hmm. It starts over again. Only uh, I'm, I'm probably going to be your grandpa, you know. And, uh, and she's going to be my mother or something. And a cousin that hardly ever visits me uh, will be my distant uh, aunt or something. But we'll keep coming back to the same boiling pot. Mm -hmm. We'll never get bored. <laughs> never get bored. <laughs> yeah, we we'll never get bored. So, uh, I, I collected all of these photographs so that I could show them to you today. And so these these chambers are used ceremonially, ceremonially mm -hmm. by people that you've trained yes. and taught mm -hmm. how to use them. Yes. And they go in and they chant mm -hmm. and they uh, meditate mm -hmm. and and. The sounds that they make and the meditations that they uh, do uh, create um, uh, a message of peace. Mm -hmm. That's so. That's why you call them peace yes. chambers. Peace chambers. Also, sound chambers. Yes, yes. yes. Because they can chant, or they can. Yeah. Yeah. Or they can, you know, dance. Like if you would dance around. Oh right. That that's what the yeah. space is around is yeah. for, for dancing. For dancing. Yeah. You see. Do you remember in the, in the Bible, I think, was uh, there's a teaching that uh, when Jesus said to his disciples, Be become fishermen of men, remember? Yes, right. Because they were fishermen, right? Yeah. Start when they first met. And so, when dancingness is fishingness. Oh. Okay. Yeah. That, that's. That's the vision. Okay. That's why the Indians dance all the time. Yeah. Because when they dance, they're not dancing the buffalo dance, although that's what they call it. They even put buffalo outfits on or deer dance and they have horns. But that's not the point. The point is that when they dance, they are um, doing what I just said. They are doing what the disciples are doing. They're impacting consciousness. Yes. They're yeah. yes. bringing it up and yes. influencing the other human beings. Yeah, and, and they used to tell us when you dance here, you're dancing for the whole world, uh -huh. not for pickeries. Forget pickeries. Just yeah. dancing for the whole world. And if you dance for the whole world, you're dancing for pickeries. Uh, yeah, of course. And when, when I was learning to draw, the medicine man says, when you draw something, like these drawings that I have here, um, each one of those drawings is a microcosm of the cosmos. Well, um, is there anything else that you'd like people to know at this time that you'd like to leave them with? Well, um, I just like to say that uh, everything is working according to the way it's supposed to be working, mm -hmm. and that those people who are here now alive, uh, no matter where they live, where they live on the planet, they are there because they're supposed to be there, and we were born because. It is up to us to experience now what our ancestors experienced. And now it's our turn. And when our ten turn is over, there will be new babies, new people mm -hmm. coming in, and they will experience what they're going to experience. And then after they're gone, then others. That, um, so not to be too um, worried about what's going to happen because whatever happens, they're going to leave this place 
better than it was when they found it, mm-hmm. according to their personal experiences. And, uh, and that since we we'll, since we're continually evolving, we'll never quite be the same 